Hey, 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 Miss Annie. Hey, what's going on, John? Not much. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be able to talk to you. I have watched your I Am Second video, and it is one of the most powerful videos I think I've ever seen. I've watched a lot of I Am Second videos. Yours is just wow. What, what an wow. amazing testimony. Thank you so much. And I've, I've heard that from a lot of different people. They're like, yeah. your video changed my life. I was like, hey, it's not my video. I think it's uh, God's story. So it's probably something to give glory to him for, not myself. But yeah. Absolutely. So before we jump into your story, tell people what you're doing right now, like where you're at and, and what all you're involved with. Oh, yay, because right now, I'm in, right now, Las Vegas, Nevada, which is such a beautiful state. If anyone's never been here, don't believe the hype on the movies you've seen. I mean, literally, like, we've had a lot of funny movies made about Vegas, but also serious ones. Like, I think that one's called uh, Escaping Las Vegas. There's one where the Elvises are jumping from the airplanes with lights. That actually happened, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and then there's uh, one with the gangsters. I think it was called Bugsy. Yep. That's a true story. I, in fact, stayed in that complex, and I was a block away from that house that got shot up by the mob behind the Las Vegas, old Las Vegas Hilton. And I'm in Las Vegas because I'm at an office, which is actually a home, and there's another house next door. We've got four buildings on this property where I'm at. I'm on a couple acre property in a part of Las Vegas that's undisclosed because we are at a safe house location for sex trafficking victims. And my passion and dream I've had basically probably the past, I would say 18 years out of, out of my life is to help women that are stuck in sex trafficking and that need a way out to heal from the severe emotional, mental, physical, and traumatic abuse they've experienced as being a victim of trafficking. And the reason why I'm so passionate about that is because I am a former victim myself that got lured into Las Vegas and all the big lights and glamor and the glitz and the gambling and the gorgeous, I love neon, you guys. I'm just gonna say it, I love lights <laughs> at night. I'm a color girl like you can't tell. Look behind me right now. I've got neon behind me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, uh, let's just really keep it real. Unicorn is in the Bible. Maybe just not a horse form. It's a rhino. <laughs> so <laughs> Vegas is my heart. I've, I'm from Minnesota. And, you know, I journeyed out here with a boyfriend of sorts. And he turned out to be a trafficker. Unfortunately. So, so to piece that story together. Uh, tell people, I know you grew up in the Midwest, but kind of tell that story, your dad and, and just kind of how it all came together, how you got lured to Hawaii and then back to Vegas and, and all of that stuff. So with all of our stories and our, our journeys, our timelines, our geoms, they call them in psychology, there is always something behind the reason why you decide to make bad or good choices. And for me, most of my choices as a little girl weren't bad. But when you come from a family that your father was an alcoholic, he was in the Air Force, his grandfather, my grandfather, his father was an alcoholic and he was in the Air Force. So we have a family that was all military on my daddy's side that came in through the Mayflower, believe it or not. Yeah. Original, original American immigrant. <laughs> and I have to stress immigrant because we were at one point in my family immigrants to this wow. country. So, but my daddy was a, a very, very abused child that I didn't realize until later in my life. And he had severe trauma growing up. He actually had dyslexia and he ended up drinking a lot. And my mom was actually his third marriage. I just found this out like about a year ago. I'm like, mom, why didn't you tell me this? You know, our family sometimes has secrets and we all know that secrets can make us sick. If we don't know the pattern and what the geome and what happened, the blueprint for our lives, we will be lost. And so when I was growing up, I felt unloved by my father. My father was abusive towards my mother in front of us children, my two brothers and my sister at the time. Very abusive, actually, John, to where I was traumatized. I think I blocked a lot of it out. I've seen my mom bleed out on the floor with a broken nose, busted eye, while my dad was driving the car, hitting her, blood squirting out of her side of her face. I mean, 
it, it's nothing that a child should see. It's something of nightmares actually, right? And what's really crazy is as a little girl, I always felt wherever we lived because we moved around a lot, my dad would get comfortable. And then, you know, and actually he got sober when I was about four, three or four years old. And we moved around a lot because as soon as he got tired of the people that were around him and the job that he had, or he got tired of the neighbors or he got in a fight with someone, we lift up and move somewhere. We lived in Wisconsin and Minnesota. We lived in Illinois. So I went to, by the time I graduated high school, I think I went to seven or eight schools, different schools, different communities. And so I was, as a little girl, very traumatized by that, number one. Number two, he, he was very uh, abusive as far as mentally and emotionally, not just physically, but more so emotionally and mentally abusive towards us children. Now, I want to say something about my father. My father was a complex trauma survivor. And if no one knows what that means, and I am too, by the way, trauma and complex trauma are different because PTSD, as we all heard about this for war veterans, is a very common thing coming back from a war. You're traumatized from that. And so you have nightmares, you have flashbacks, and a lot of people get addicted to drugs, they get depressed, and some unfortunately commit suicide. Now with complex trauma, it can happen to war veterans as well. And anyone that's been in an earthquake or a car accident, or they've experienced a family death, or they've got a sickness and they're taking care of a partner that's sick, they can experience PTSD. And it can last a lifetime if it's allowed to. And if you don't get your help and counseling for it. For me, complex trauma was a little different. Complex trauma is formed when you're in an abusive relationship, and that could be a, fam a family type of relationship where your parents are there, but one of the parents or both parents are abusive, number one. Number two, if any of the parents have abandoned the child, even if they're there, but they don't speak with the child, they don't interact, they're just there as a family member providing, that can actually be a form of abandonment. Now, if a parent leaves, same thing, but just a physical form. And then also when a parent is an addict and they're um, living out their addiction in front of their children, the children can actually develop complex trauma because they don't know how to be children because now they're becoming the adult because they're trying to take care of their adult child, right? right. So it can form with these different uh, geomes and different scenarios. And the other thing, when a parent is just lacking empathy, compassion, and physical touch that can affect a child's brain to a place where they can develop complex trauma and complex trauma is any time someone feels like they're in danger and they don't they don't feel like they can be free to be themselves they don't feel like they're loved or cared for so naturally what happens to a child in that state of mind they will go out like i did see that boys give them attention, or maybe if it's a boy, it's maybe girls are giving him attention and they become maybe sexually promiscuous, which I did and didn't realize it was happening to me because I was just looking for love. So there was this huge, massive hole in my heart. And it was, I, I felt like it was like a, if anyone can picture space, because I love sci-fi. <laughs> I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm a Star Wars fan, okay? But <laughs> black holes. Black holes are beautiful, right? They're, they're, they, galaxies surround them. They're gorgeous. Some, some black holes, not all. We know that there's black holes in space that you can't see. Dark matter, right? But in particular for me, I felt like my heart was beautiful. I knew that I loved people and I served my family well. I was one of those type of people that were people pleasers. I wanted to make my dad happy at all costs. I wanted to make my mom happy and proud of me. But as my teenage years hit, I noticed that there was this major hole in my heart. And I'm going to tell you the, the truth. My whole trauma started definitely when I witnessed my dad hitting my mother, but also when I, when I felt like my dad didn't love me. And that is a lie of the enemy because my dad's love language was something I didn't know that it was until after I realized my own personal trauma that I was dealing with when I overdosed and found it got better. So my dad's trauma, and this is very common with parents, you can pass your trauma down to your children. And so whatever his struggles were in his life with his father that got passed down to him, I mean, it's like that song, Chain of Fools. You know, it, it will keep going if you don't 
have a catalyst to stop the ball, the snowball from running down that big hill. So my, my basically, uh, I would say snowball effect was the fact that I felt loved and comforted by any attention that a boy gave me. I mean, it literally lit me up, John. It was like, I was so attracted to relationships. I wanted to have a relationship and get married. Like, can I give you a really quick story? Really sure, fast. Absolutely. Me, me, my mom and I were talking about this uh, actually two nights ago. I said, mom, do you remember telling me the facts of life? She's like, I don't remember. I said, because you never did. Now my mom learned as she was growing up, you weren't to talk about things like that. You are not to talk about sex, okay? That is a big no-no. And she was raised Catholic, so it is what it is, right? So we think about the 40s and the 50s being raised in the 40s and 50s. Did they talk about sex with their kids? Probably not. For me, I found out when I was 10 that my mom and dad had sex from my next door neighbor. I was like, my girlfriend, she was like, oh, my mom and dad, I found out that my mom and dad have sex to make me. I was like, what? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So I was shocked into reality of, my parents had sex. How gross, 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 gross. Right. But when I was about four and like I said, I was a big, big fan of Star Trek. I asked my mom, I remember doing this. I said, mommy, she's like, yeah. I go, mommy, how do you make a baby? Because you know, when you're little, you have dolls. I mean, little girls want to hold dolls and whatever. I was like a doll fan. I had Barbie dolls and I had little baby dolls and whatever. So I asked her, how do you make a baby? And she said, oh, you, you, you fall in love. And that wasn't good enough for a four-year-old because guess what I did? I was in love with Captain Kirk on Star Trek. So I was for a couple weeks very worried. I, I was looking at my stomach. Um, I did go there and I thought I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm amazing what young, how, your, how your imagination works when you're young. Kid, I mean, right? my mom laughed so hard. She goes, I can't believe that you thought you were pregnant. I said, mommy, you told me, okay? You told me that you fall in love to make a baby. And she goes, you know what? She goes, I did say that, didn't I? You know what her mother told her? Her mother told her, um, if you kiss a boy, you'll get pregnant. Oh so guess gosh. what? My mom thought she was pregnant when she kissed her first boy. So <laughs> although we know it could lead to that, we know we could lead to, it could lead to, you know, a couple getting together and making a baby as a young girl. I mean, you just, you're like, Oh, if I fall in love. So now that I knew that I wasn't pregnant, you know, obviously I knew that was a lie, but I got into my teenage years and I started dating and obviously I gave myself away to the first boy that told me he loved me. And I actually felt like I did love him and he broke my heart. Of course, he was dating three of my girlfriends on the side. I did not know that. One of my girlfriends pulled me to the side and said, we just had sex last night. I said, what? And I was devastated. So we broke up. And that heartbreak, I think, John, really affected me just about as much as it affected me that I didn't think my dad cared about me. He wasn't really involved in my life. He just went to work, came home, watched television, was a TV dinner guy. He ate separately from us children. It sounds really weird, but TV, gener TV dinner generation. He just didn't prefer to eat with us unless it was like a holiday or a special occasion. And so I didn't really ever have that interaction of a father figure. And if I did, it was definitely disciplinary style. And it was this relationship of like, and say for instance, we, we went to bed at night and my mom would make us line up to kiss my dad on the cheek good night. It was like forced. Well, and I, was so sorry. and I think to unpack that before you move forward, to unpack that because so many people I deal with, uh, you know, they think an absent father or abandonment issues. They don't realize though that you can be physically there, but emotionally absent and emotionally abandoning that child. It causes complex trauma. I got facts for that. I can yeah. cite that one. That's definitely for anyone listening out there right now. I just want to encourage you because if you've grown up like this, it's like me, and maybe it's a little bit of a different scenario. Maybe it was your mother who wasn't there, but she was there, but worked three jobs. It doesn't mean she doesn't love you. I think as a child, we, we read love differently because we don't know what love looks like if it's not modeled correctly. I have to say this, my mom to this day, she's alive. 
She has modeled love like no one I've ever seen in my life. She is a saint, John. I love her so much. She has been so good to me and us kids. And she, if, if anything my dad did, it, her sweetness and grace and love and understanding and unconditional love or agape love made up for everything my, my father did that was against his children and her. So I push well, it, forward into my life. Yeah, and, and, and even to that point, I think you mentioned a while ago, understanding that your father's father was abusive and i know your dad had some anger and rage issues i think he you, sure did talked about. he sure did and and to know that that was passed down and and you know i think it's such an important piece because i know it was in my life in understanding and i've said this so many times it's understanding my dad couldn't give what he didn't have right exactly yeah. you're empty like that like that galaxy with the black hole it's pretty it's sparkly it's planets and suns and stars and in the middle of that is, 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 a, is a gaping black hole of it's not enough. The stars and the moon aren't enough. The galaxies and solar systems aren't enough for me. I need to fill myself up with something. And if he had that void, he passed that void on to me. And I don't think he even understood that. Yeah. Bless his heart, man. Because I'm going to tell you what about my father. There were some good things about him. He bought us a lot of gifts he made sure we had what we needed, except I never had nice clothes growing up, but I always had garage sale clothing, but I still had clothes on my back. We had food in our house. My dad was a hard worker. Wherever he went, he got the top position. He was smart. Dyslexia and all. Didn't know he had dyslexia until after he died. Because I saw his writing and I said, mom, why is dad's writing so small? She goes, I think he had dyslexia. And some of his stuff was written backwards. And he even expressed that to my mom. I think I have dyslexia. Never got tested for it, but we, we know now that he probably did have it. And did you know that dyslexia is actually formed from complex trauma, some dyslexia? Oh, I did not know that. It, it's crazy what, 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 what trauma can do to your brain as a child. Yeah. And what, what being abused can do. So my dad got severely abused. I did not find this out until 2006, which is now, how many years ago is that? About almost 14, 14 years ago? Because he actually told me himself, I got abused as a child. I was like, I didn't know that, dad. But uh, as I moved forward in my life, I, I realized, you know, there is a gaping hole in my heart. However, I didn't really care. I just needed to get that thing filled. And it's kind of like the putty. Whatever can fit in there at the time, put it in there for the, for the interim. Pat it up a little bit. Make it look like it's filled. And then if it doesn't fill and that thing cracks open, get a new thing to fill it up. So that's what I did. Relationships were my first fill. If I could hear a guy tell me he loved me, I would be loyal to that guy. I would be loyal to that boy. A hundred percent. I wasn't a cheater. I've always been like that. Um, even though later on in my life, it became a call girl. And to me, you know, selling yourself and then being trafficked for that is a form of cheating. If you ask me, I mean, it's adultery times 1000, right? But at the time I didn't think that. So as I fast forward in my life, I got three jobs, left home, went to Minneapolis. Cause at the time I was living in Minnesota or Wisconsin and I was overworking myself. I am a workaholic. I fully admit that. Okay. <laughs> I love what I do though now. So, but I, I wouldn't consider myself a full workaholic now. I do take a lot of breaks now, which is very healthy. But what ended up happening is we went out to a nightclub one night, my girlfriend and I, and we met these guys that were undercover traffickers and we had no idea. I saw that they had money. It like really floored me. I was like, okay, that's my next fix. I don't have a relationship right now, but if I had some money, whoo, baby, let's go. I don't know why money to a lot of people, which is the entire, almost the entire population is comforting. I don't understand that, John. I don't get it because money can't buy you happiness. Money can't, you know, it can, it can attribute to better health care. We can't admit that. If you've got money, you can get the best doctors. But does it prolong your life or does it hinder your life? I mean, money is power, right? Money is choice. Money is grace. Money is favor. But I really, really felt like if I had money, I could become successful in my life. And if I had money, people would respect me more. I don't know why that is with society and why humans tend to think that, that if they do have money, people will love them deeper. What people don't realize is when you do have money, you can get exploited for that money. Well, and it's Very never enough. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it's never enough. You always want more. It's never enough. I mean, if you look at the richest man in the world, which I don't even know who that is, is it Warren Buffett still? 
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that hasn't done anything. I mean, everybody wants his money. I'm like, I'm trying to get a grant from Warren Buffett and get a grant for the agency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, hey, you know, does money really solve issues? It, it can, but ultimately it's not. If you, if you think about someone dying at their deathbed, are they going to say, oh, wow, I just, I like Joyce Meyer says this, and I know a lot of other people that have said this and preached this and psychologists have said it. If I've had enough money, if I, at my deathbed, what, what would I say? Oh, wow, I wish I had my bank account bigger. I wish I had hired more people to, to mind all my mansions. It's like, no, you wish your family was shown love more and that you, could, you had the chance to tell people you loved them more and yeah. that you had more time to spend with them. Yeah. That is the priceless entity that I, I think later in my life, didn't figure that out until later, but I ended up quitting all three of my jobs and I went to Hawaii, my girlfriend, and we got turned out. It's called turned out in the game of pimping and pandering, but it was sex trafficking. I did not have a trafficker in the beginning, how could a girl like me, a Minnesota girl, like innocent girl, went to church. I, I was a Lutheran. I got saved when I was five. How could a woman like me make a choice to sell herself? It was simple. My hole was a black hole in my heart, and it was a vacuum, a massive vacuum. Whatever I could take, I took. And so to get trafficked wasn't right away. So this was ultimately people, I've heard people criticize my story before and say, well, she chose that lifestyle. You know, that's her choice. I mean, like she's really not a that job. That's a lie. Okay. Vulnerability and complex trauma can create a victim. That's all I need to say about that. Yeah. If you're vulnerable and you're not adult enough in your mind, and I was a teenager, John, I was a teenager. When this happened, yes, 18 and 19, but I was still a teenager. Do you know the scientists say that our brains aren't, our brains are not fully formed until about 25 ish. Yes. We shouldn't be really be making any major, major decisions at that age at 18. You really shouldn't. And I believe that's why the national drinking age is 21 because even at 21, we're dummies, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, people well, still it, get it, in their cars. And I think to your point car. too, it's not only were you a teenager, but you have these people that are master manipulators, masters at what they do. So it's, it's very easy for so. I mean, that's why human trafficking is such a big thing now. That's why it's yeah. such a big ordeal because these guys are good at what they do and they're preying on girls like yourself, you know, in several different circumstances, runaways, girls that didn't have good dads, good moms, whatever. Right. And, 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 so, and, yeah. and, here, and this is what's really cool about this whole, what you're saying right now, people would say, well, usually it's like the poor population. It's like the, the runaways, you know, the parents were addicts and no, 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 no. I have seen girls that came from well-to-do families get in being a call girl, prostitute, you know, by choice, then they get trafficked. So no one can put that scenario, well, who's getting trafficked? The vulnerable. Yes. However, there's, there's populations that are wealthy that have gotten trafficked, that were raised in homes where they had their full college education paid for at Harvard. They've gotten trafficked. Well, and so, I think to that, no, and that's an important part for people to understand and know. And the people that I talk to and deal with, it doesn't matter how much money you make or how less of money you make. I know wealthy families where the son or daughter is a mess because a dad, the way he shows favor and instead of spending time with them, he gives them money. That's oh. his way. Right. And so he prostitutes them off. He yeah, exploits that, them away from himself. That's, that's as big an issue. Yeah. The fatherless, that abandonment, that's another form of abandonment. So, so the echo and, socioeconomics of of it all yeah maybe there's a larger percentage there is that right. may be poor but still it happens across the gamut so absolutely right and i this is you know what i feel like we could have 10 shows about this this is like so multifaceted with how someone gets trafficked why they get trafficked i mean there's 24 25 forms of trafficking i don't know if you knew that or not but so my particular strain i would want to say of trafficking was sex trafficking full 
full sex trafficking, which meant I was a call girl in Hawaii. We actually walked the street and went on some calls with an escort service. But when I got back to Minnesota, I quit all three of my jobs and started working full-time escort servicing, which if anyone doesn't know what that means, it's when someone calls an ad. And back then we had no fancy smancy smartphones. We didn't even, uh, computers back then had no internet. So I'm dating myself, of course, 1987. Okay. <laughs> oh, now, what's really hilarious is men were calling women with yellow page ads. Okay. And I would answer those ads. My agency was in the yellow pages. And yes, trafficking was all up in the yellow pages in the 80s. So I'd go on a call and I got a machete to my neck and a shotgun to my face. And I quit the escort service in Minnesota. I was like, forget this. Lake Minnetonka mansion. I don't care where you're at, where by Prince, where Prince lives. No. So I started working the exotic clubs on Hennepin Avenue, St. Paul, Minneapolis, in the surrounding areas, Wisconsin, traveling from dance club to dance club. And that's where I met my trafficker. I met him at the Skyway Lounge in Hennepin Avenue, which is now Spearmint Rhino. That's the name of the club now. It's a strip club. Yeah. And I met him and he was handsome and debonair and another hole in my heart being filled. And let me tell you, when I saw him, John, I was enamored. In my book, it's called Julian. Here's my book. Fallen out of the sex industry and into the arms of the savior. By the way, this is in Spanish, but I have it in English too. Love it. And we talk about Julian in there. That was my name pick. It's not his real name. But Julian came in looking all debonair and handsome, and I felt like he was going to rescue me from myself, like straight up. Like I thought he was my answer to all my problems. And he told you knew. everything you needed to hear, right? Of course. He was like a father figure to me. He cared for me. He watched over me. He bought me nice things. And you know, there was something I never got to do with my dad. I never got to dance with my dad. This guy danced with me. Um... I'm thinking about my, my dad right now and I'm getting teary eyed because I think if he had a chance to do it all, all, all over again, he would. And he's passed away now, but the great thing about my father, my father loved Jesus. He gave his life to Jesus when he was a young kid, but then when he surrendered, when he had his uh, AA, uh, when, he, when I was a very young girl and uh, he never stopped believing in God. He made us go to church. I'm thankful for that, by the way. So, you know, this guy that I met in the club, I just, I was just so enamored by him. And I brought him to Las Vegas. My girlfriend, the one that went to Hawaii, he had moved to Las Vegas and I ended up calling her a lot and she called me and I told her, I said, Hey, the money in Minnesota is not good at the strip clubs. I'm tired of this place. And she's like, come to Vegas, girl. It is popping here. And I am not, John, I am not going to kid you. This place had hardly any call girls. Like I could count on my hand how many were on that Las Vegas strip. And the boom of Las Vegas was just starting. The Mirage was the first themed, like real, like brand new themed hotel that went up. The new themed hotels, because we had older ones like the Aladdin, the Imperial Palace. We had the Flamingo Hilton. We had the Dunes. We had the Sands. I mean, this brings back so many memories for me because these hotels are all gone now. But they were slowly tearing them down and building new ones. And so the Mirage was the first one. I, I moved down here when the stilts were put in the ground for the Mirage Hotel. Wow. Brought him with me. The first night that I got here and worked at the escort services, he beat me down to a pulp and told me to break myself and said he was a pimp said I'm, a, I'm i'm your pimp now you better listen to me and if you don't listen to me i'll kill you now now mind you a, a smart person right a, a woman she's at this point i'm 19 i'm like well hold up hold up wait a second no you're not my pimp boom another another hit in the face shut up you know and you can fill in all the blanks with every bad swear word you can imagine Sure. He was screaming at me at the top of his lungs. And I, I swear to you, his eyes were black. It was literally like there was a demon controlling him. Now, he has a geome, too. His mother abused him as a child. Really bad, by the way. Used to beat him. So do you think he had a vendetta against women? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, probably at the time he did. Did he have complex trauma? Absolutely. His daddy took off when he was three or four years old, never came back, was an alcoholic and a gambler. Mm-hmm. Two trauma complex kids getting together to make a party. What kind of mix is that for a cake batter? It's called trauma cake, okay? Trauma cake with icing. The icing of beatings, name calling, emotional isolation, uh, physical abuse, mental abuse, monetary abuse, sexual abuse, all that wrapped into that cake. And that's the recipe for disaster. And that's what I had to live with for the next, for him, five years. He, I mean, I'm telling you. And then when I left him finally, after he almost killed me many times, by the way, put me in trunks, was going to dig a grave for me, beat me in front of six other pimps. I ended up going with another guy that was just as abusive, another pimp. Except he was a prettier pimp because he didn't have other girls I had to share him with that I knew about anyway. And so this guy abused me for another five years. So 10 years, a decade goes by of my life. And John, I had made millions of dollars at this point. Like I averaged, and back then you can double the amount because I averaged between 2000 on a bad night, and this was in the 80s, so double that amount to 4000 2000 to $5,000 a night in money I averaged. Wow. Gave it all back to the pimps because that was what was required of me. The second pimp, I only gave him a little bit. I didn't give him as much, but I was still being trafficked. And that pimp actually locked me in his house and put bars on the windows and I couldn't leave without a key. So I never had the key. He had to open up the door for me. I have nightmares about that still a little bit, about him lighting a fire, because he used to to threaten me and say, I'm gonna light a fire and burn you to death, B. And I'd be like, ah! And I couldn't get out. Like, if you have bars on your house, and it's got a fire going, you can't leave. So a lot of trauma, a lot of brainwashing. Threats, a lot of, just, yeah. I mean, I was, I was marinating in complex trauma all those years. Did I disassociate? If anyone doesn't know what that means, it's when you take your mind and you put your mind somewhere else and you pretend you're not being abused. That's one way of disassociating. I did that a lot. I fantasize a lot about, oh, one day I'm going to be okay. One, and you know what? In all respect, you guys, here's the thing, John. I had a lot of hope in my heart because I knew, and I know this sounds absolutely ridiculous to some of you listening right now. During the times where I'd go to a suite in a beautiful hotel and a, a client, I wouldn't say client, a buyer would be raping me and holding me against my will, I prayed. And I knew angels were with me. And I knew Jesus was there. It sounds crazy. It sounds like you're out of your mind, Danny. No, I truly believe that God's grace was just, just covering me, covering me with his love and his bubble. The Father's love never stopped reaching me and protecting me and guiding me. And did I get out of it? Absolutely. August 2nd, 2003 was my overdose. And I believe that uh, the, the Lord just came in and just, oh, Man, I am so thankful for that overdose. And I say that with tears in my eyes because I got set free that day. I literally got set free from tyranny, from from sex trafficking, from complex trauma, from abuse, from mental, like mental trauma, emotional trauma, and my addictions. Like literally, he, he I got like ridiculously delivered now was i perfectly delivered like in my physical body not as much but in my spirit i was whole right and, and you said in the- i think in in your story too you talk about literally the doctor said girl you shouldn't be alive yeah he told me that i had so much narcotics and i'm allergic by the way to narcotics i'm allergic to painkillers <laughs> go figure i'm allergic to cocaine and i was literally on cocaine 24 seven before I die, before I overdose. And I overdosed twice in one week. I don't tell a lot of people that, but yeah. Uh, the painkillers were a big habit for me as well. I was doing about 20 a day, floor set tens. Yeah, I mean, you guys, honestly, and I was hooked on Oxycontins too. When I couldn't get my floor set tens, I would do Oxy 80s and Oxy 40s, if anyone knows what that is. I, I don't even know if they make them anymore, it was like the fentanyl of its day, right? So, yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, like, literally, and then 
the other thing happens to me. So I start healing. I start reading my Bible. I start watching Joyce Meyer. And I just, I got so transformed. I can't tell you the Holy Spirit, like, oh my gosh, God's presence is so real. It's so tangible. It's, it, it's like God wrapped his, his arms around me, around my heart and squeezed it and my body and my mind and just bathed me in like glitter love. I don't know how to, how to call it that, like gems falling down. And I was like, I, I would have these dreams that I was like, I'd find gems and rings and all this treasure that would be glowing and I would hold on to it. I would wake up and the Holy Spirit would say to me, that's my love. I want you to hold on to my love because it's real. Don't let go of me. You know, Annie, I'm healing you. So uh, I started Hookers for Jesus in 2005. It, it was crazy because I started doing an outreach to the girls that were just like me on the Las Vegas trip. I would go to the, go to the Las Vegas casinos, the beautiful hotels and sit at the bar where I used to sit. And I would sit down and talk to the girls that are working the bar. I'd tap them on their shoulder at the elevator and I'd say, excuse me. And they'd be like, yeah, what do you want? I'd say, I just want to let you know that you're beautiful and that God loves you so much. I used to work. I, I know what you're doing right now. And here's my card if you need me to help out. You need to get away from your pimp if you have a pimp. You know? And man, that's what started Hookers for Jesus. I felt a call in my heart. Jesus appeared to me in a dream. And he told me, go down on the Las Vegas trip and talk to my girls, my daughters that are in sexual slavery and tell them, simple message, I love them. I love them. How simple is that, right? Yeah. I love That's it. That's what started, started our, our, our organization and it's a nonprofit. So that stemmed into taking women out of their bad situations into giving them a home, which is called Destiny House. And yes, I knew in my heart I had to do this. And actually, I think we're the first survivor-led safe house in the country. Very the first. cool. Now, there's, there's a lot of safe houses now, which is amazing. I love it. But I have to brag, survivor-led, nothing like us at the time. Nothing. I mean, and here we are now. And I'd love to start more homes other places, but <laughs> was born and, and uh, Destiny House. And here's what's really, really, really cool. So I started doing this outreach. And in 2006, here's where that great story, I want to call it the blanket, the blanket. So I like to crochet. And in 2006, I, I actually went home for Christmas before my dad died. And my mom went to work and she was, she worked at a, an old folks home and stuff and the hospital, she'd go there and help everybody that were, they were transitioning into their new life, right? Graduating into heaven. So my dad was home and I made some juice and I, I told my dad, I said, daddy, I called him daddy. I said, daddy, I, I made you this juice. And we had started talking. I had finally got to tell him what I did, how he had wrecked my life and I got trafficked and he, he started crying, John. And he took the juice and he said, I need to apologize to you. I need you to forgive me for the way I treated you because if I would have been different, I don't think you would have gotten trafficked like you did. And I tell you what, those tears were real. I hugged my dad that day. And I actually sang that song by Aretha Franklin. I said, chain, 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 chain of fools. And I said, Daddy, it's okay. I said, we just broke the chain. You and me just woke up. Amen. And we are catalysts for good now. Um, I, and then he said, I have to tell my, my brothers. Like He wanted to tell my brothers he was sorry. And I told him, you need to tell my brothers you're sorry. My sister had passed away at this point in 95, so he couldn't tell her. But I said, she could watch us from heaven. She knows that you're, you're sorry for the way you treated her. But when I was 12, I used to crochet and I, I crocheted my dad a blanket for Christmas. And I didn't do it for my mom. I didn't do it for my grandmother, my brothers, my sister. I don't know why I was compelled to give him this blanket. And I remember him opening up the present and being very happy about it. It was huge. It fit his whole bed. It was every color. It was a rainbow blanket. It was like every color was about this thick. It was a couple scarns of yarn. And... My daddy kept that blanket since the day I gave it to him. He, he put it on his bed and I never saw, saw his bed or his, his, his chair that he sat in to watch TV without that blanket. It's, I just thought about this the other day. 
And when he went into the old folks home, cause he was really, really ill before the end of his life, he had pancreatic problems because he started, unfortunately, I hate to say this to everyone, my, my dad succumbed. He started drinking after 42 years of being sober, he started drinking again. And his pancreas gave out on him. He was in a home. And unfortunately, my mom, I should say, fortunately, my mom worked there. So she saw him every day. But he brought that blanket. He told my mom, I want that blanket. She brought it to him. And the day that he died, he had that blanket on him. Hmm. And uh, that, you know, it showed me, God, the Holy Spirit showed me past like 48 hours. Your dad was trying to tell you that he loved you because he treasured that blanket. He never was without it, John. He was never without that blanket. Yeah. And that means so much to me. It means the world to me to know my daddy care enough to have that blanket on him and I just want to say to anyone out there right now that restoration is possible and that maybe that person in your life that hurt you so deeply your daddy he really did love you and you just didn't see it and be waiting and be looking for signs that he just didn't know how to show you and maybe this was his way for me to show me he cared and that he treasured that blanket because he knew that I loved him despite the way he treated me. Just, just understanding it. This is such a, a, a big thing here. I think back to the, my dad couldn't give what he didn't have just coming to the realization of your dad didn't know how to show love because he was never showed love. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to share you know, it says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who would ask him? And that was like my gift to my dad. And I think he realized that, that I loved him and wanted to give him a gift. And maybe my gift was comfort because I knew somehow deep in my, in my heart that he wasn't loved correctly. And I wanted him to feel love. And do you guys know about trauma blankets? So there's these blankets that you can get now that are heavy. And that blanket was really heavy um, that can make you feel like you're held. And maybe I instinctively knew that my dad didn't feel loved. Mm. So, I mean, did he know he was loved by Jesus? At the end of his life, we talked about Jesus a lot. And I have to tell you about this conversation we had. It was probably about a... 10 days before he died. I had just visited him in November. He died in December of 2016. And he called me. I called him actually. It was his birthday, November 29th. And I said, daddy, um, hi, happy birthday. And he was on the phone. He goes, Annie, he goes, I'm afraid. And I said, what's wrong, daddy? He's like, I think Jesus is coming to get me. I think I'm going to die. I feel like I'm going to die. Man, was he dead on. He, he died like literally 11 days later. Like, it's crazy. Like, he died and he knew it was coming. And I said, Dad, I said, Daddy, if you think you're dying, let's pray. Well, what was really odd about my dad, I have never heard my dad pray. He started praying and he goes, Dear Jesus, I'm scared. But if you're going to come get me, I'm ready. I love you. I mean, you should have heard the prayer like a little kid. <laughs> like he trusted him. And so for me to show the love and forgiveness towards my father, I think it set him free. Now, yeah. my, my father and my mother were not getting along at the end of his life, but my mom did forgive him. And, and he, he had a hard time. He had a hard time with not living anymore at home because my mom couldn't take care of him. There was too much going on. He had heart failure and that's actually how he died is he, he died of his heart just gave out on him. He just, uh, his heart filled up with fluid in his lungs and then his legs swelled and then he couldn't breathe and they gave him morphine and then he died like literally a couple, like a couple hours after they gave the last uh, dose of morphine. And unfortunately I didn't get to be there, which really was hard on me, but um, I'm at peace. I, I, I feel like he's watching us right now as we speak. 
I, I love it. You know, and, and as we begin to wrap up, Annie, let, let me let me ask you a question because I think this is important for dads with daughters to understand and know. And I think they get what you said and how you've said it. You had that hole inside of you. Uh, you know, a lot of people say there's a father shaped hole inside every daughter and God shaped hole and, and all of that. And if we don't have that, that father hole filled with our dads, then we are that, you know, as young ladies, we become promiscuous. We go do all these different things to try to find that father's love that we didn't get from our earthly father. And so m the majority of the women that you go and minister to, is it a really high percentage of them that, that had a similar story to yours that had oh, probably some type of abandonment or father issues? Man, every single client has had a family issue with either the father or the mother, mostly the father, mostly the father, unfortunately. I hate to say that, but if I look at all of our records, and, and uh, I keep really good records, we have a really great case management system here, but the geom is usually a father that wasn't there a father that was there but abandoned them in the midst of the the family dynamics and relationship or or he was an addict or the father sexually abused them or mm -hmm. an uncle did it's got just there's so many connections with the father figure it's it's super powerful i i can't tell you and, and even with myself i heard many times the holy spirit say to me you got an issue of trust because you don't trust me because you didn't trust your father. And I'm like, Lord, you're right. And he heals me to a new level. And I don't know who I'm speaking to out there, but you need to listen right now. Some of you don't trust God because you never trusted your father and you need to knock it off. God is to be trusted because he is faithful and he is our father. He is the father of lights. He is where the light and the love comes from. He puts the love in us and he can be trusted. Jesus could have had that same excuse, John, right? Yeah. I mean, in the garden, he drank the cup of <laughs> adversity. He drank the cup of disease and demons and whatever else, the sin of the world was on his shoulders. I mean, but he still drank it because he trusted the father. And I told the Lord a long time ago, Lord, I want that trust. I want to drink this cup and I want to trust you. But even if I'm about to get crucified in this situation, and there's many situations we can get crucified in, right? Yeah. Um, that you're going to be there. Even well, though I might feel abandoned, but I know you're there. And, and I think to that, one more question <laughs> before we wrap up, because it brings up another thing that I think we, we need to understand and know. You're perspective of your earthly father and how he treated you and and what you, he expected from you and all of that how did that influence your view of your heavenly father in the very beginning i i i don't know if i understood that god loved me fully i think that i believe in the beginning that god was mad at me and angry at me that was there was no grace for me and if there was, I would have to beg and plead for it. And I know that to not be true now. But as a little child, that's how you think. And then I thought, maybe I'm unlovable. And maybe my dad doesn't love me because I'm such a mess up. Because I'm, I'm dysfunctional. And I'm, there's something wrong with me. That's the question that plays over and over in a child's mind that's being abused or traumatized. They think it's their fault. We're so self-centered at the same time we're, we're, we're givers. We want to please everybody, but yet we're so like, everything's our fault. And if I would have understood that, that it wasn't my fault and that it was a generational curse, cursing my family at the time. And I say that at the time, because I believe we're, we've broken up my brothers and my mom and I, we have broken our family curse. It's so amazing. But the only way we could break in this curse is to acknowledge the, the need for that hole to be filled by Jesus. Yeah. And, 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 so, and that view being you felt that way about God because of the way your earthly father was, the way he treated you. Yes. 
I think my, my awakening moment was literally not just my overdose, but as I successively daily got better, because, you know, our faith in, in our, in our salvation, it says in, in the Bible that it's walked out with fear and trembling, but every day that we walk towards the light of God and his love, we physically heal piece by piece. And sometimes miraculously overnight, pieces will be healed. But it's like, for me, my heart was shattered in so many different pieces. There were so many pieces to pick up. But again, like I said earlier, as soon as you say Jesus's name, you're whole. You know, in the spirit, God sees you as a whole being. And when you are, you know, raptured or, or transferred into heaven, I mean, your body's going to be brand new and you're going to just be boom, you know. But to realize that and believe that you are whole in your spirit and you're walking towards physical wholeness, towards the light, it's like that is that glory to glory where you're getting renewed every day. And every day I learn something new, and sometimes it's weekly, about the Holy Spirit and God's love for me. But I do know now that he loves me. There is no way I could ever measure that the hole in my heart has been filled by that love. And I don't have like this chasm chasing me anymore, this vacuum wondering what my purpose is. What am I, am I loved enough? Am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? Like, again, that could be a haunting nightmare, but it's less and less because that, that vacuum shut off now. Yeah. You know, that, that, that life that va- it's a life vacuum when you don't have healing. It really is. It's a trauma vacuum. And and it's it's such a game changer actually knowing and believing with all of your heart that you are a beloved child of God. Even though we sometimes have to be reminded of that <laughs> because of our the stuff that we deal with, the shame and worthiness, all the stuff the enemy attacks us with. But just truly understanding and knowing that that you right. are you are a beloved child of God and he is proud of you believes in you loves you more than you could ever imagine right right and i That's, think the mistakes too any mistakes we make people can like totally like give up on the faith because they've made a mistake they feel like they're not worthy that's a lie from the enemy like i i think my best teaching has been when i made my mistakes by god has gently put me back on the pedestal and said come on girl you can do better. And I'm like, yes, I know I can. Thank you, Jesus. You know, so to, to understand that God is a forgiving God, he is a grace filled God. He's all about mercy. Yes. He's a God of justice, but mercy before justice. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. Well, I just, tell people, tell people how they can connect with you website, how they can get your book, connect to social media, whatever. Yeah, so on social media, I'm Annie Lobert and Hookers for Jesus. So if you see those little at Hookers for Jesus on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook, and then Annie Lobert on, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. I'm on Snapchat too. I think it's under Hookers for Jesus, but I hardly use Snapchat because I kind of don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just learned about TikTok. I'm like, oh my gosh, TikTok, another Snapchat. I don't get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and hookersforjesus.net, like fishnet. So some of you are probably wondering what, why hookers for Jesus? Well, it literally is based on, I will teach you how to fish for people. People that are drowning in the waters of abuse, trafficking, addiction, hookersforjesus.net. Get it? We'll fish you out, put you on the island, brush you off a little bit, dry you up, give you some food, give you some comfort, and give you some love. And our whole motto here is hook, help, hope, heal. And then Destiny House says dream, discover, develop destiny. So that's what we do. And we love what we do. And I love our staff and our volunteers. We're, we're survivor led. We have a lot of survivors on our staff and our volunteers. And so, um, I, I think that uh, the call on your life is bigger than you realize. Anyone listening out there, God's healing you right now as you speak, as, we're, as you're listening to us speak and share, because he has a purpose and a plan for you. And your destiny is bigger and greater than you can even imagine. And like it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, thoughts for good. We know good means God. Thoughts for God, good, not for evil for a future and a hope and 
in Jesus, it's our hope that we will all be with him one day. Now, we can have him right now if we want, if we just ask him into our heart. It's that simple, right, John? It's that simple. Yeah. You are, preach, girl. Go. Just <laughs> run with it. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, that's the whole thing. Surrender. People ask me this all the time. How did you, gosh, girl, how did you heal? Like, how did you start doing what you're doing? My first step was surrender. Now, mm -hmm. did it have to be an overdose? No. It was a successive surrendering of my heart to him as I even leaned into that, that overdose because I actually surrendered to him before that overdose. I had a prayer. I was in Italy. I'll never forget. And it says it, it talks about it in my book, but I asked God, I said, God, help me get out of this industry. Help me get away from this abuser. Man, John, he did. He opened the door and here I am a minister a woman of God. Oh my gosh, I'm a preacher. Oh my gosh, I'm a teacher. Oh my gosh, I'm a counselor. Yeah, all those things and more because his purposes and plans are bigger than you can imagine. Can he use a messed up girl like me? Could he use the woman at the well? Could he use that woman in adultery? Could he use Tamar? Could he use Rahab? Absolutely. Did he? And will he? Yes. And in fact, we have several relatives that are in the lineage of Jesus's life, and one of them is Rahab, and one of them is Tamar. They were both admitted prostitutes, admitted harlots. They're in the Hall of Faith, okay? Well, Rahab is anyway. Hall of Faith. I have to brag about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for everyone out there listening right now, okay? I you don't have to be an ex-call girl to, to know the goodness of God. Amen. You know what? And that's what I, I, I can only imagine. One of these days, I'm going to have to come out when I'm in Vegas. I don't go to Vegas that often. But when I'm in Vegas, I'm going to have to come check your organization out. I can only yeah. imagine the lives and the legacies that oh, you're Oh, man. And you know what, John? And I, I'm going to take you with us on the strip. And I'm telling you, you're going to see when the strip's back open anyway. <laughs> yeah. We have this little thing going on right now. We can't really, the casinos are closed. But Hey, when, when this thing blows over, it's going to be popping. We're going to go down there and we're going to reach out to these lovely souls that are craving for yeah. love and care and intimacy that are just using this lifestyle as a mask to mask their pain. Yeah. The, the yeah. hole that we all had in our hearts at one point. Right. So Absolutely. yeah, we are hole fillers. Jesus is the hole filler. And now I, I fill holes. So that's I hole, awesome. I, I love it. I love it. I <laughs> so, love it. I yeah. love it. Hey, let's stay in contact. We are going to talk more about some stuff uh, as we jump off here, but I greatly appreciate you. I know you're super busy and got a lot going on, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, don't forget one more thing. Everyone can also find me at Pink Chair on CTN. So CTN Vegas, but it's actually CTN Network. You just put our name in there. It'll pop up, and you can watch our show every week. It's a talk show that... I got asked to do and I said yes and I think I'm a little crazy but yeah I did it and maybe John you can come on there and promote the father effect I'm, I I'm on be I'm game you just come on let, man you let I mean, me know when come on yay <laughs> <laughs> I am in I'm all in cool absolutely cool I'm excited all right girl we'll talk to you soon thank you okay. again thank you you're welcome it's a pleasure all to right. be here today see you bye